Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am going to do something that uh, I'm really looking forward to these two hours. I'm going to just tell stories. Um, I've been an activist on the GMO front for 26 years. And <clears throat> I'm going to just share some of my favorite stories that are quite revealing and some of them amazingly outrageous when you think about that, that companies like Monsanto are getting away with it. I learned about GMOs in 1996. I went to a lecture by a, a, gen a genetic engineer who was kind of blowing the whistle. Um, he was talking about the fact that they were about to plant genetically engineered soy and corn in Iowa where I was living. And uh, I realized that the he told us that the technology was not ready for prime time, that it was prone to, science, to mistakes. And he was a genetic engineer. He was working under grant from NIH. He was an award-winning scientist. And he knew absolutely for sure that no human being on earth had the ability to safely and predictably manipulate the DNA with expected outcomes. So he knew that companies like Monsanto were going to be gambling with our health and gambling with the ecosystem. Because with soy and corn, the outputs of soy and corn are in most processed foods, the derivatives. And the once you release the soy and corn into the environment, it will cross with relatives with, with non-GM corn. Uh, soy doesn't typically cross-pollinate, but there's some. But it could contaminate the gene pool forever. So when I learned about this, I realized this was a number one priority. And maybe I'll help out a little. So <clears throat> I wrote some lectures and consulted and had some fun with it. But then I got hired as the vice president of marketing at a GMO detection laboratory. And it was a neutral laboratory. It didn't take a position on GMOs, but its work was very important to help non-GMO products be produced because the biotech industry was trying to convince the world that you couldn't tell the difference. They even told Dan Glickman, the Secretary of Agriculture, who traveled through Europe trying to promote GMOs, he just mouthed what they said, that you can't tell the difference. But from a, using genetic tests like PCR, of course you could tell the difference. And when he found out, we heard, he was really angry at the biotech industry for lying to him so that he would lie to Europe. Well, this molecular biologist was aware that you could tell the difference and Europe didn't want GMOs and the US was saying, well, you have to take it. There's no way you can tell. So he created the first laboratory to detect and quantify GMOs in US exports, <clears throat> which allowed soy and corn and then canola and other things to be sent to Europe or to be used in non-GMO declared products in the United States. They were also certifying products as non-GMO, kind of a precursor to the non-GMO project. So I worked there as the VP of Marketing Communications for a couple of years and was basically being paid to become an expert. I was reading all of the data um, that was coming in around the world on GMOs. And there was one interesting thing. Most of our clients, nearly all of them were companies, but at one point we got contacted by a consortium of activists <clears throat> and they were looking for Starlink corn in corn products sold on the shelves. The reason why they were looking for Starlink was because it wasn't approved for human consumption. There were some things in the Starlink that indicated it could probably be a allergen. And so in the infinite stupidity of the EPA, as if they have absolutely no concept of how things are produced, shipped, and stored in the United States, they approved the Starlink corn for animal consumption and not human consumption. Now think about it. You have some farmers growing corn in one field that's unapproved for human consumption. 
in the field next door, you have the human consumption corn, and it just takes wind blowing the pollen at the time that, it's, that the other corn is tasseling, and now you have contaminated the human food supply. But also, farmers were not really told ever that this was not approved for human consumption, so they would sell it into the big storage elevators, and they weren't told it wasn't approved for human consumption, and so it was a ticking time bomb. And this group, led, led, this group of activists sent, I think, 23 samples to our lab for testing. So one day I get a call from the lab manager, and he said, we found it in Kraft taco shells. And I was like, this was intense news. So I said, don't tell the client, retest it. I'm going to meet with the, with the CEO and the, and the chief scientific officer. So we met with them. They tested it again two more times. They sent the PCR product for sequencing to make sure it was Starlink. And then we told them the results. They put it out a press release. It was a billion dollar problem. All of these foreign countries that import U.S. corn, Europe, Japan, China, shut their markets down. Over 300 brands were subject to recall. I was interviewed by the New York Times and, and all these different places. It was, we were being called constantly. And then we were attacked. Now, they didn't attack the activists who sent us the brands. They attacked the laboratory, claiming it's impossible. So I was on the phone with Kraft and giving them the, the, the lot number, and we shared some of the tacos with another lab, and they confirmed it. So all of a sudden, the attack simmered about four or five days later. We learned our lesson. We should have had another lab confirm it before we told the uh, client. But anyway, it was uh, fun to be right there in the headlights in a global emergency that literally cost about a billion dollars and alerted the world that the US could not keep GMO and non-GMO separate easily. And many times countries would even refuse to take any products from any country that was growing a GMO version of it. And there's been other contamination events since then. I was not part of the laboratory. What happened is before I went to the laboratory, I was thinking about writing a book, but then I put it on the shelf when I was working at the laboratory. And I was reading all of the press every day. And there was no, almost no press in the United States. Um, Everything was coming out of Europe. And one time there was an article in the international uh, version of Time magazine, and we were all excited because this was going to be the big first breaking story on GMOs because no one knew what a GMO was and we were eating it already. This was 99 and 2000. And when it finally was published in the United States, the American version didn't have the GMO story in it at all. So there was a tremendous amount of censorship and bias in the mainstream media, which has been later documented and verified. So I realized that I was motivated to get the word out in the United States. And I'm gonna describe in a moment a story that happened in Europe <clears throat> that led to a European rejection of GMOs based on the information about the health dangers. So I decided to write the book, Seeds of Deception, which is the subtitle is Exposing Industry and Government Lies About the Safety of the Genetically Engineered Foods You're Eating. Now, it was all about the safety. At the time, after I left the lab in 2000, no, no GMO organization was diving into the health dangers. They, they were focused primarily on the environmental problems, the farmer need to save their seeds and the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few companies and the, the fact that patenting life should be illegal. They had four or five sentences dedicated to health, 
No long-term studies have been done. We don't want to be used as guinea pigs. It could create allergens, toxins, or anti-nutrients and could lead to antibiotic resistant disease. That was the extent of the global dialogue on the health dangers. It was as if the public relations efforts of Monsanto were successful in <clears throat> bullying anyone that talked about the health dangers. So no one wanted to go there. So I decided to go there. And I realized that since people didn't even know what a GMO was, the book could not be a dry scientific uh, book. It had to be a storybook. And I realized there was a lot of great stories out there. And I'll tell you some from the book and then some since. But one story that kept coming in different forms, which then was inserted as a single page between every chapter, was how when given a choice, animals avoid eating GMOs. Not every time, but so often Cows, pigs, chickens, geese, elk, deer, raccoons, buffalo, dogs. I, I was hearing it from people, but I was also reading stories. Um, there was a flock of geese that landed every year in a certain place. I think it was in Nebraska. And when they landed after GMO soy was planted in one field, they all concentrated in the non-GMO field. There was a, a pig farmer who showed his uh, friend, I think it was a reporter, he said, watch this. He called his pigs in, they all ran. He took a, a scoop of corn and threw it out there. They all looked for it, smelled it, and then looked back at him like, are you playing with us? Are you kidding? And then he scooped from another place and sent it out. And Sure enough, the pigs ate it. And the reporter said, what's going on? He said, first one was GMO. There was another farmer who his cows would not eat GMO corn. And so in order to get rid of his GMO corn, he put non-GMO corn in the feed bunk and GMO corn on the top. And they, he forced them to eat from the top to the bottom. There was a, uh, a lab that was testing GMO for a private enterprise, GMO or non-GMO, and they were testing for their neighbors, and they had a dog, and whenever they threw the cornmeal to the dog, the dog was like a testing equipment. The dog would never eat the GMO and only eat the non-GMO. Um, there were chickens that wouldn't eat. It was just going on and on and on. And it was interesting as I traveled around, um, starting in 2003 when uh, Seeds of Deception came out, <clears throat> I would always report on that, the fact that animals wouldn't eat GMOs in many cases when given a choice. And there would be always some people that came up to me and said, you know, when I read your book, that was the thing that convinced me more than anything else. So there's like a huge number of people where that's the main thing. Um, even rats in my, in my book, I describe, uh, Tomatoes, the flavor saver tomato, uh, was designed for longer shelf life. And the CEO of the company, Calgene, that produced the tomatoes, was interviewed and reported that you could be, he said, you could be Chef, D, B, or, Chef Boyardee, but these rats, he got it wrong, they were actually mice, these mice will, will not eat these tomatoes. So, but they fed them to humans, so we're eating the stuff that the mice rejected. Anyway, that's, that's a whole series of stories that I've compiled in Seeds of Deception, which are fun. But I had to decide which, what was gonna be the first chapter. Now, typically the first chapter lays out the science, but I figured I could turn people off like that if I just go into the science. So let me read you the first page of the book and I'll see, show you how I wrote the book and kind of why it became the world's best-selling book and remained the top-selling book for years and years. So this is chapter one, and I'll fill you in on the rest of the story in a minute. It's called A Lesson from Overseas. When Susan answered the door, she was startled to see several reporters standing in front of her. More were running from their cars in her direction, and she could see other cars and TV news vans parking along her street. But you all know that we can't speak about what happened. We would be sued, and 
It's okay now, the reporter from Channel 4 television interrupted, waving a paper in front of her. They've released your husband. He can talk to us. Susan took the paper. Arpad, come here, she called to her husband. Arpad Pustai, a distinguished-looking man in his late 60s, was already on his way. As his wife showed him the document, the reporter slipped past them into the house, but Arpad didn't notice. He was staring at the paper his wife just handed him. He recognized the letterhead at once, the Rowett Institute, Aberdeen, Scotland. It was one of the world's leading nutritional institutes and his employer for the previous 35 years. Until his sudden suspension seven months ago, and there it was clearly spelled out they had released their gag order, he could speak. The document was dated the same day, February 16th, 1999. In fact, less than 20 minutes earlier, 30 reporters had sat in the Rowett Institute press conference, listening to its director, Professor Philip James, casually mentioned that the restrictions on Dr. Pustai's speaking to the press had been lifted. Before James had finished his sentence, the reporters leapt for the door. They jumped into their cars and headed straight to the Pustai's house on Ashley Park North, an address most were familiar with, having virtually camped out there seven months earlier. Now those 30 reporters with TV cameras and tape recorders were piled into the Pustai's living room. So that was how I opened up <laughs> the book. Uh, it was a story about Arpad Pustai. And Arpad, in order to write that chapter, and I'll explain what happened, I had to interview Arpad for hours and hours. And unlike other writers and reporters, I always sent my reviews of science and situation to the source for fact checking, because we knew that Monsanto was going to challenge it and I didn't want to get anything wrong. And so every single word in my books have been reviewed by at least three scientists, um, if they have to do with science or stories related to that. So our pod was able to speak about what happened and it created a frenzy. Within a week, there were so many articles written about GMOs in the UK. One editor said it divided society into two warring blocks. There was some independent newspapers who were against GMOs, some who were for GMOs. There was articles every day in major papers. And within the first month of him being able to speak over 700 articles. In fact, it was such an onslaught that in one week, Nestle, Unilever and Nestle's decided to commit to no longer using GMOs in their European brands. And then that followed by everyone else in Europe, but not their US brands, because this whole eruption was described by Project Censored, a US media watchdog group, as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year. So no one knew what was going on in the United States. Since I was reading the European press, this was going on while I was working at the GMO detection laboratory, I realized there's some interesting information, but it started seven months earlier. You see, Arpad Pustai was one of the greatest scientists in the world. He was the top in the world in his field field of protein research called lectins. He, in fact, created that, that um, focus. He worked at the Rowett Institute, and he was their big money magnet. Um, he had done 350 or so different um, uh, peer-reviewed published studies. Um, he had done a tremendous amount of nutritional studies with rats, and it was very, very meticulous and very, very careful, far more than almost any other laboratory in the world. And the UK government put out a request for quotes to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. And there were 28 different applicants and our pods team won, won the grant of about $3 million. And his purpose was to create the protocols that would eventually be adopted by the European Union to require the safety assessments for the submittal of the GMO uh, products. So he worked with three different institutes and a big team, maybe 20 people, to create those protocols. 
And they decided as part of their evaluation to use those protocols in terms of a rat feeding study on a genetically engineered potato that was slated to be released. The potato was engineered to produce a toxin to, to kill the potato beetle. Toxin was called BT toxin. Uh, no, excuse me. It was called GNP toxin. And um, this toxin was something that Arpod knew about. He had studied it for six years. He had given very large doses to mammals and to rats. They, it, it had no effect or very little effect. It was not toxic to humans or other mammals. And so when this snowdrop lectin protein, which was supposed to be produced in the, in the potato, when, it, when he was suggested that we feed it to rats, he didn't think there'd be any problem. He didn't even think that the rat feeding study would be necessary, but his wife, who was his boss, Susan, insisted. So they fed a group of rats the potato engineered to produce the lectin. They fed another group of rats the normal potatoes that were not genetically engineered. They fed a third group of rats the lectin without the potatoes, which was a key ingredient. So they had the GMO potatoes producing lectins, just the lectins, you know, squirted into the diet and regular potatoes. It turns out only the group that had the genetically engineered potatoes got sick. They had potentially precancerous cell growth in their digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, and damaged immune systems in 10 days. Now, the group that ate the lectin with the same balanced diet did not have these problems. So it was not the lectin that was the cause of the problems. It was some other aspect of genetic engineering. And genetic engineering causes serious health issues that are not predictable. And this was one of the first indications that that was true. And so Arpod was very concerned and he got, he was ready to put the stuff together for publishing his research. He got a call from um, the World in Action TV show asking him to be interviewed. He called Professor Philip James, his director, who gave him permission, and they agreed not to release any specific data because it hadn't been published, just to speak generally. And he went on, they interviewed him for half an hour, knocked it down to two and a half minutes, and they quoted him as saying that he would not eat the potatoes that he'd tested, that there were problems, and that it's not, it's not a wise idea to use our are the public as guinea pigs. So that exploded in the news in August 1998. Here was the top scientist in his field and one of the most qualified humans on earth to talk about the safety of GMOs because he had been studying for three years how to test for the safety, saying that they weren't safe, which contradicted all of these other governments, including the UK government. So he this was on a Sunday night, Monday, it exploded at his lab, all these reporters were calling for him, and all of a sudden he didn't get any calls. And he just figured, okay, it blew over. The director had forwarded all of his calls and emails to, him, to his own office. He thought this was going to get a lot of money for the Institute, and he started talking up the research and saying how great it was, and even put out a press release that turned out to be wrong technically wrong. So when Arpad Pustai learned about that, he met with the director the next day, pointed it out that it was wrong. And the director said, Oh, my God, this is the worst day of my life. He had to issue a correction. But then two phone calls from the UK Prime Minister's office were forwarded through the receptionist to the director. Now at the time, Bill Clinton was the President of the United States. There's an understanding of some that there was a call from Monsanto to Clinton, from Clinton to the Prime Minister of the UK, Tony Blair, and then his office called Professor Philip James twice in the afternoon. 
Now, Arpad and his wife were expecting the release of the new press release. Instead, he was called before a very stern looking committee the next morning and informed that his contract was not going to be renewed, that he was not going, his team was going to be disbanded, the data was withdrawn, and because they couldn't just fire him, they just said basically he has to sit, sit in his office until this contract, in other words, they fired him, but continued to pay him until the contract expired. They also threatened him there and in later documents that if he said anything to the press, he could be sued for an indeterminate amount of money. So there was a gag order on him. And then the, the Professor Philip James and the biotech industry set, a, set upon Ar Arpad Pustai as their, pre as their prey. They put out information that he had made mistakes, that he must have gotten things wrong. They lied about what, how, what the test revealed. They lied about the structure of the test in order to protect the reputation of the biotech industry. He was unable to speak. The people in, in where he was having lunch in his in his facility wouldn't sit with him. So he and his wife just had lunch in his own office. He was ostracized. He had a heart attack. He, he was absolutely frustrated because he could not speak. Then seven months later, the parliament, the Lord, House of Lords, invited him to testify. And that meant that he could get his data back. A lot of his data was stolen by a burglar in the house that came in the house and stole all of his papers. So they really cleaned him out. But they were forced to give back the data. And he was able to speak. And then he published his research in The Lancet and additional uh, releases. <clears throat> and it remains the most in-depth animal feeding study ever conducted up to the Seralini study. And he also saw a similar fate by, at the hands of the biotech industry. So I knew that there was details in this report that wasn't being handled by the press in the UK. There were such details and the details I just gave you, no one knew about it. No one knew about the fact that his research implicated the process of genetic engineering. And here was the interesting point that also no one reported. I always asked everyone that I interviewed for the book and since, what was the most shocking moment? Because I figured I'd open the book with it. And I didn't. So what I read to you was not the most shocking moment. It wasn't having the gag order lifted. It wasn't being fired from his job. It wasn't discovering the damage with the rats. It was something that I had never anticipated. It was months before. You see, there was going to be a vote in Brussels by the ministers in Europe. And the UK Minister of Agriculture was going to do a vote on GMOs and asked Professor Philip James, the director of the Route Institute, to give him some suggestions. Now, he, he called Arpad and his wife and put on their desk six or 700 pages of the submissions of about six or seven products from the biotech industry to the UK. The reason why James had those submissions, which were secret, was because he was one of the 12 members of the committee to approve GMOs. And Arpad realized that James was a committee man. He wasn't a working scientist, nor were any of the other 11 members of the committee. They were political appointees. They were policy people, but no one probably had ever read these submissions, ever. And so he was told that the UK prime minister wanted to get an opinion on these. And could he look it over with his wife? And Arpad said, how much time do we have? And he said, two and a half hours. <laughs> so they went directly to the design and the results, just those, because they didn't have much time. And Arpad said to me, that was the most shocking moment. Learning how absolutely poor that research was. He said, you know bad science, and this was bad science. They were doing as little as possible to get their foods on the market as quickly as possible. There was nothing of substance in there. So we called the minister and said, I, wasn't, I can't give you a strong recommendation after two and a half hours, but there's certainly not enough information here to approve GMOs for human consumption. 
And the minister said, I don't know why you're telling me this. Those foods are already approved. They've been on the market for two years. That was a shock because people in the UK did not know they were eating GMOs. He just needed a scientific opinion to share in the meeting. So a few months later, when Arpad saw these damage to the rats in every single system that he tested, their development, their immune system, etc., he realized that the shoddy, superficial research conducted by the industry would never find these problems. They weren't looking for them. They didn't weigh the organs to see that certain ones were less, they cold looked at, they eyeballed it, etc., etc. And he realized that the process that they used to create the GMOs on the market was the same process used to create the potatoes that caused that significant damage. And so those problems could be accumulating in the human beings eating the GMOs. And that meant that he had to get it out to the world. So that was his most shocking moment. And I'm sad to say Arpad Pustai passed away in December last year. And he was a dear, dear friend. And I'm sorry that he's, he passed. He was actually unable to speak in the last few years of his life after a stroke. But he was a very, very important man in this world. Because when he went public, it erupted in Europe and caused the food industry to commit to stop using GMOs, which completely derailed the, the schedule that the biotech industry was going by. One of my earlier colleagues had gone to a biotech conference, I think it was in January of 1998, and heard one of the, I think it was a, it was the Anderson Consulting that were consulting with Monsanto. And the way they wanted to consult with these top executives, it says, okay, describe your ideal future in 15 to 20 years. And the executives of Monsanto described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds in the world were genetically engineered and patented. And then Anderson worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. My friend said that was the most arrogant statement he'd ever heard in his life until the afternoon when Another consulting organization predicted that in as little as five years, by 2003, no, actually it was, it was a 1999 conference, by 2004, within five years, up to 95% of commercial seeds would be replaced with genetically engineered seeds. So they were planning to replace seeds on the planet. And then a month later, in February, Arpod was able to speak. An eruption happened in Europe. Europe closed its doors. So that we have a great, great debt of gratitude to Arpad Pustai. And also it taught me that I needed to focus on the health dangers and get that information out. And so I traveled the world for years and I'll tell you some of the stories of my world travels and focused on getting the health dangers out. In fact, in the book, I said that my next book's going to be about how there's positive alternatives to farming that don't need GMOs. I never got to that because I needed to, there was so much more information about the health dangers. There was so much pushback by the biotech industry that needed to be corrected. So I became the health danger guy and also the corruption guy because you can't tell people that these are dangerous if the FDA and Monsanto say they're safe. So how could we discredit the FDA and Monsanto? It's easy. It's so easy. I'll show you, share some stories that I share. One, for example, is that the person in charge of GMO policy at FDA was Monsanto's former attorney, later Monsanto's vice president, and later the U.S. Foods are. That because of documents made public from a lawsuit, we now know that the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA who are looked at, looking at GMOs said that they were different and dangerous, needed to be tested, and even human testing needed to be done. And the policy came out written by Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, saying, we know of no significant difference between GMOs and non-GMOs, therefore no testing is needed, no labeling is needed, and you don't even have to tell the FDA if you want to put a GMO in the, in the, in the food supply. So that immediately tells everyone, okay, 
So it's a captured organization. How bad is it? You need that to open the receptor cells. Okay. So I released the book in Washington, D.C., did a National Press Club uh, release. Um, <clears throat> I then went to, uh, within two weeks, actually, within a day or two of releasing the book, someone said, I was invited to speak in Brazil. I don't want to go. Can you speak on my behalf? So I was already scheduled for that October in Brazil. And then I went to Mexico, to Cancun, for the World Trade Organization. I went with, cre with press credentials. And so I went to a press conference, and there was the U.S. trade representative and the Ann Venom and the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. Now, I've been to press conferences, and usually like 30 or 40 press in a room, and I was feeling very confident. I'm going to ask them a tough question. So I walk in and it's this auditorium, at least 600 press, a bank of cameras all over the world. And I was intimidated. <laughs> I mean, oh my goodness. I'm, I, it's like, am I gonna get a question out? Uh, so they gave their talk. And I raised my hand when they asked, we have time for a few questions. And I think it was like five questions. So they didn't call me, they didn't call on me. Fifth person, last question, they called on me. So I, I pack my questions. I did this later with the Secretary of Agriculture, that's the current one, and another. I, I just make the questions, give the information I want. Given that GMOs are this way, given that this, given that this, given that this, how can you justify no uh, safety studies and whatnot in, in, uh, in the approval process? And it was interesting that the, that the US Trade Representative Zolek said, I'm having trouble hearing you. All of the press laughed because of course he couldn't hear me. It was like it was like an inside joke to everyone but him. So I had to repeat it, which was great. And then he spoke, praising GMOs and all. And then Secretary Veneman spoke. And she said, oh, we look at these very carefully. We look at this, we look at the agronomics, we look at the health. And I got her, I said, this is not true. I know what they do, and there's no required safety studies whatsoever. So there was a press room available to the 2,000 or 3,000 press at the World, World Trade Organization. So I got a computer, I printed it out, uh, a press release. I gave it to them and said, make uh, six, 6,000 copies or whatever it was. And I put them in all the cubby holes. And it was a press release saying, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture misleads WTO delegates and global press on safety, GMO safety, uh, U.S. GMO safety assessments. And uh, also when I left the hall after asking the questions, I was surrounded by press asking me questions. So it worked. I, and I put my phone number. I had, a, I had to get a Mexican SIM card. And I got a call on the SIM card saying, uh, we'd like you to come and speak in Brussels in November. <laughs> so I got, you know, October in Brazil. Uh, then five more times in Brazil, very interesting meetings. Then I went to Brussels, and who else was speaking in Brussels? Um, Vanda Nashiva. I had met her in the WTO conference. She was very generous and warm. She was speaking. Um, the daughter of the president of Germany was speaking, who was a scientist. Um, the person that got um, Vanda Nashiva into GMOs, um, Pat Mooney, he was speaking. So all these very important people, and the room was filled with members of Parliament and EU Commission and all these people in this big Brussels conference all day. So I give my talk and someone pulls me over afterwards and says, you know, if what you say is true, you have the bombshell. Because if GMOs are not safe and they weren't approved right, it doesn't matter about the environment issues, the patenting issues, the, the legalities, they will be they can be taken off the market. That's the linchpin. So this was like great gratification for me because I had spent all this time, nine months writing a book, planning this whole trip, all this stuff, put my, everything else in my life on hold because I figured this was the missing link. And here was saying, this person who was prominent in the anti-GMO world saying, this is the bombshell. In fact, the first time I gave a talk on GMOs, it was at a bookstore when I was launching it in DC, and the person who read the book in order to introduce me said, this is a bombshell. 
So this, they use the same words, bombshell. And it turns out that it did actually work. And the story format worked because I remember um, when the, the rep representatives in uh, the state of Vermont passed the first state regulation on GMOs, I had a, a half-time intern from Vermont who was working with me at the Institute for Responsible Technology. And then when he left, he did his master's thesis on the impact of seeds of deception on the passage of that regulation. And he would, he would interview all these people and they said, yeah, we don't normally read a book during when the session is, is being held. But once I started, I couldn't put it down. And then we passed it around and his book became the topic of every discussion on GMOs. And then when I went to, to Vermont and met with the agriculture committee, they gave me a standing ovation when I walked in the room. So um, it was really critical, the angle and the story factor that worked. So it was very gratifying to see that early on. Now, before I actually left the GMO detection laboratory, I was, I was at a workshop in St. Louis. I love to dance and I was taking Lindy Hop weekend in St. Louis, which is the type of swing dance. And um, we were on a lunch break. So I went to a Thai restaurant with a bunch of friends and some other dancers came in the door and we called them over to sit with us, I, we don't know them. And one guy sat right across from me. And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a, yeah, I'm a molecular biologist. I work at Monsanto. <laughs> Whoa, talk about a setup. I said, oh, what do you do for Monsanto? He said, uh, I do the safety studies on the GMOs. So I wasn't an activist at the time. I was working for a neutral GMO laboratory. So I, and this was lunch, and he was a fellow Lindy Hopper. So I kind of just lightly discussed allergenic constructs over the meal. <laughs> and what, you know, there's no way they can block against that. And then I said to him, how do you know, like when you insert a gene, there's some mutations. That, that's inevitable. You can't help that. How do you know that you're not messing up parts of the genome that are important? And he said, we're learning all the time which are important regions. I'm thinking that's a little late. We're already eating GMOs. And then I challenged him. I said, what if it's all important? What if the every piece of the se sequence uses laws of nature that we haven't discovered, maybe even quantum mechanical, maybe quantum field effects. What if it's all important and you're disrupting things you can't even measure at this point? He was looking at me and then he just looked down and continued to eat. His friend that came with him said, that was deep. <laughs> but there was a long silence. No one said anything. It was at least a minute. And he looked up and he said, but you know, we need GMOs. I said, what? He said, we need GMOs to feed the world because in 2040 or 2050, there's going to be so many people. And I knew he was sincere. And I knew he was wrong. I knew already that the feed the world concept was something that his PR firm put out to the world and that there was more food per person than any time in human history. GMOs don't actually increase yields, et cetera, et cetera. We've won that argument a long time ago, but he was sincere and he was wrong. But that was his answer. When I got to the bottom line question, what are, you know, might you be hurting people? And his answer was, we need it to feed the world. So he was willing to accept what he didn't know because he had the excuse that the benefit was too great. Which reminded me years later, which I was reminded of years later when I interviewed a, interviewed a Dr. Goodman who was working for Monsanto doing research studies. And I went into deep, this was a phone conversation. And it was for help with the, producing the book. And we were going into the very technical details of the structure of the amino acids and the proteins produced by genetically engineered corn. And I said, but look, you can't 
obviously verify that you're not creating a protein that could be allergenic to at least some members of the population because you cannot validate that something is an allergen until people have eaten it multiple times and you would need a huge sample of people eating it in order to do a study so some people might get allergenic might get allergic responses and might even have anaphylactic shock and might even die as a result and it was there was no way he could get out of it scientifically so his response was but we need gmos <laughs> the same point we need gmos i said why he said to feed the world and it was like that it's just because when you get to the end of this road and you win in the science they leap to some idealistic need and what he said was i've been to india i've seen their agriculture and they need our gmos so fast forward they end up introducing gmos in india and they introduce cotton and they make a cotton that's genetically engineered to produce the bt toxin to kill the boll weevil and it was a disaster so the cotton was tested on irrigated fields and most of the fields in india are not irrigated it's rain fed the yields that were reported were never achievable in real world examples no one believed it who knew under, who understood the science so they came in with potentially fraudulent research and knowing we know we know about research that they do i'm convinced it was fraudulent and they had an unprecedented marketing program they used bollywood actors they paid off the the rich farmers in the area to have big festivals they had um they promised all sorts of improved uh profit they had people standing next to tractors claiming that it was the the, the cotton seeds they had people who weren't even farmers you know with quotes it was complete fraud and they even had someone you know um doctor results locally adding a little one in a pen of different color to try and improve the uh the the, the viewpoint of the public on these failed uh, genetically engineered cotton seeds well some of the cotton seeds wouldn't germinate at all some produced smaller bowls bowl, uh, cotton with lower lower quality cotton that required more labor cotton that was shorter in its fiber so it, it fetched less in the market sometimes the, the gmo cotton was overrun had root rot or leaf curl and later if they did kill off the bt i mean the the, the uh, boll weevil they were um, swarmed with other insects requiring multiple sprays and the push by monsanto was so successful in getting these farmers to invest in these seeds which were marketed as much as a thousand times more expensive than the same seeds you'd get in the united states they had to buy the seeds and certain chemicals they couldn't they couldn't get loans at the bank so they went to loan sharks called the secondary market some of these farmers had signed on the dotted line to pay interest of seven percent per month and then when the seeds failed throughout the cotton region they were faced with losing their land to the loan sharks land that had been in the family for years huge disgrace and many committed suicide based on estimates and door-to-door -door surveys and leaked documents and work done by vanda nashiva we now estimate that the number of suicides among bt cotton farmers linked to the failure of their cotton is about 250,000. So this is what this doctor from Monsanto, this science scientist, he was saying we India needed it. But there were some other pieces there that people were reporting among the workers that they were getting itching and flu-like symptoms. So in my second book, I looked at the documentation of the symptoms of people who were sprayed with the bt toxin which is a natural toxin it was sprayed in the pacific northwest to to kill um uh some pests there um and they had all these 
specific symptoms. I looked at the doctor's report in India of people handling the cotton, and sure enough, it was the same symptoms because their cotton was genetically engineered to produce this Bt toxin at thousands of times the concentration of the spray. People leaning against the bales. There was people in the cleaning, the, the gins where they were cleaning the cotton, they had to take antihistamines every day to go to work. In addition, there were reports of farmers, from farmers who, or ranchers who brought their, their animals to, to graze on the cotton plants after harvest, which they'd been doing for years, and many died. There was a place where 13 buffaloes died. I went to this village in India. 13 buffalo died the day within three days after grazing on, on the cotton. And many sheep, half their sheep and goats. It was absolutely terrible. But also I said, how many of you have noticed itching when you are working in the, in the uh, fields? All these people raised their hand. So we have a toxic um, protein produced in this. We have some kind of toxicity in the plant and we have a system which results in massive suicides. Now, in most places in the world, the approval process is a sham. <clears throat> Same thing with India. Mo because a lot of governments are pro-GMO, they assign with the recommendations of the biotech industry, the scientists to be on the approval committee that will be rubber stamps. And so there was a Supreme Court petition in India claiming that it was a facade. And so the Supreme Court asked PM Bhargava, one of the most decorated and celebrated scientists <coughs> in the world to investigate. He became a member of the Genetic Engineering Approval Committee. And about nine months later, he wrote his report, sent it to the, to the um, Supreme Court, sent it to the, to the Prime Minister, and sent it to the Health Minister. And he said, it is a facade, that it's a rubber stamp. He said there are maybe 30 studies, categories of studies that need to be done in order to approve the safety of GMOs and less than 10% have been done. And they've been done by industry and so poorly, they're basically worthless. So no GMO crop anywhere in the world has been properly investigated. Now, as soon as he put this out, he was attacked by members of the, of the committee that he had just been a part of, saying he has no experience in DNA research. Well, he had more studies published than on that and the entire committee put together in nature and science. He was he 25 of, he told me, 25 of his close personal friends and former students have Nobel prizes. So I went and, and videotaped my talk with him for a couple of hours. I was releasing my book, Genetic Roulette in India and sat with him. And he described all of the things that needed to be done to test for the safety. Now in Genetic Roulette, I had come up with all these different risks, 65 different risks of GMOs and all this critique of the, of the uh, ways that GMOs could be dangerous and how they needed to be studied. And I had gotten it from dozens of scientists. Here was this one man listing nearly every single one of them. The change in the, D, in the genome, the change in the protein, the combination of genes, the effects on the environment, the, the folding, misfolding of the protein, the added sugar chains, things that got very technical, and he was just laying them all out. I said, how is it that you have such a wide perspective to be able to name all of these things? He said, these days, most scientists are, have blinders on. They're just focused on their one area of research. But I've been doing this for decades and decades, and I'm focused on big wide angles like the origin of life on the planet. He, he was dealing with these huge things. He was the head of the, on the knowledge committee, which reported to the prime minister that had access to all the data and all the science, et cetera. He was very well respected, and he had this wide thinking. And he was saying what we had taken 30 scientists to conclude, no GMOs were properly regulated. We could not get through to the prime minister. He was very focused on promoting 
IT and biotech. And I've met with top ministers, the government ministers in India. When I released my book in 18 different cities around India, um, very often it was a minister of ag or a minister of health that was there to, re to release the book. The states were against it, but the federal government was in lockdown. And I've seen this before because certain ministries are been captured by Monsanto. So this past week, the government of India just approved to deregulate most gene edited foods, uh, organisms, which means you can genetically engineer through gene editing anything and put it in the environment or put it in the food supply without telling anyone. So it's a disaster, but they're not the only country. So that was my India story. Now I want to talk about, I was traveling in Europe and I met a former, I just happened to meet a former Monsanto scientist. I do that from time to time. Um, and he told me that when they found the fed rats, GMO corn, and the rats had serious problems, the scientists rewrote the study to hide the effects. They didn't withdraw the corn, they decided to hide the effects. Well, he was concerned because the amount of corn that was fed to the rats in the study that lasted just 90 days is a fraction of the amount of corn fed to people in South Africa because they use it as a staple three times a day. Typically, Monsanto has a maximum amount of GMO corn of 33%. But in Africa, 50%, sometimes 70%, even 90% of the caloric intake can be corn, especially in times of famine. So he was concerned about releasing this GMO corn in South Africa, and sure enough, it was released in South Africa. Later, I was interviewing a veterinarian in the United States about GMOs, and he had told me these horrible changes that occur in animals as a result of their eating GMOs. But then he told me this story. He had a South African client, farmer, who had all these problems. He described the problems with his pigs and cows. He was losing money, low milk production, problems with the legs. His, cow, his pigs had like Alzheimer's symptoms. They were cannibalistic. It was just a disaster. So we gave him all these things to do, and the farmer said, look, just tell me one thing. So he said, okay, never feed your animals another GMO again. So he started growing non-GMO corn. When he started feeding the animals the non-GMO corn, they all got better. He ran out of corn because he hadn't uh, planted enough, had to get corn from the marketplace, which was partially GMO. Problems came back. Then he planted enough year-round non-GMO corn, fed it to the animals, and the problems got went away. But his farm workers were eating the same corn. And when his animals were having problems, no one knew why he had to hire 20% more farm workers because so many were sick, severe headaches, flu-like symptoms, colds. He was spending a inflammation. He was spending a lot of money on medicines and hiring 20% more farmers. He had to hire 60 instead of the 50 he actually needed. And the farmer told the veterinarian that once or twice a month, he'd be talking to one of his workers and the eyes would start to track in different directions. And he said he knew based on experience within one or two days, that worker would be dead. He had no idea why. When the worker started eating the non-GMO corn that was grown for the workers and the cows and the pigs, all the problems went away. When he ran out, problems came back. But the problems were probably worse when they were not buying it from the marketplace. They were, because the marketplace was a combination of GM corn and non-GM corn, because not every corn grower in South Africa was growing GM. But on the farm, they were growing only GM corn. So the workers were eating 100% GM corn three times a day. And so were the cows and the pigs. So they were the canaries in the coal mine. They were eating more GMOs than perhaps anyone on the planet, except other farms like that in Southern Africa. So this 
is a sobering, sobering story of what may be happening to us on a slower basis and what may be happening to the population. Now, I visited South Africa and Zambia and Namibia. And uh, in, in preparation to go to South Africa, a very interesting investigative journal uh, did an interview with me. And it was called Nose Week. I love that name, Nose Week. Long, long article. And then um, someone who's a paid biotech person decided to, to challenge it and wrote this whole um, description. Obviously, I had help from Monsanto. But it was all stuff that was lies. And so I then wrote a many, many page rebuttal to that. And it was published online in Noseweek as well. And then I got contacted by someone in Zambia because I was going to a conference in Zambia. This major paper wanted to get rights to republish the original article in Noseweek. And I said, sure. So when I get there, there's a two full page spread opening, opening this newspaper, big newspaper two full page spread of just my article and a picture of the president of Zambia in the middle. I was told by some locals they had never seen an article so big in the history of their two year, two duck decades in the country. So why was it put in the government paper? They also arranged for the government uh, radio, the government television. I addressed the House of Chiefs with Mei Wan Ho, who was a great scientist who since passed. It turns out <clears throat> years earlier, Zambia was facing a famine along with some other sub-Sahara countries. And they had a law, no GMO seeds, no GMO food. The United States, unlike other countries, instead of giving money to places that have famine, they send US made crops, which many people are angry about because it displaces and disrupts local production. And it's a way of promoting US interests under the guise of promoting famine, you know, famine relief. But that aside, they were going to send soy and corn, <clears throat> particularly corn, full kernels to these sub Saharan African nations. And so the, the Zambian government created a committee to evaluate whether they should allow these GMO corn and soy. And they looked at the health and they looked at the environment. They looked at the trading and said, no, absolutely not. They actually went around the world. They went to Europe, they went, and they came back and said, absolutely not. So they said no to the United States. Other countries said, can you at least grind it, mill it so that our farmers won't replant it? And the US said, no, take it or starve. So Zambia was able to get food from somewhere else. No one starved, no one died, and no one had to eat the GMOs. <clears throat> Thank goodness, because when you have immunocompromised, malnourished people eating corn three or four times a day that's genetically engineered, we saw what happened in South Africa. But this was like blasphemy for the US government, because this was a country that was star that was supposedly starving, turning away the GMOs that were supposed to feed the world. And the US decided to do a full court press to try and convince them to change their mind. I interviewed some Jesuit priests there who had been doing research on the GMO corn versus non-GMO corn and came out against it. And someone lied to the head of the Jesuits in the United States saying, they said, let them starve. I'd rather let them starve and die rather than feed GMOs. That was a lie. They got Colin Powell to intervene with the head of the Jesuit order in the Vatican to try and stop them. They, uh, they sent all these experts, so experts, congressmen and senators. I was talking to the former minister of agriculture. He was inter introduced to Secretary Ann Veneman, and she was told that he was from Zambia. She looked at him and said, backward country, and walked away, insulting him. It was a absolute horrible time for Zambia because the United States was bullying them constantly, trying to get them to change their mind. I said to the Minister of Agriculture, next time they try that, he had 
switched to a different uh, ministry at that time. But I said, next time, if this happens again, contact me. I'll know what you can respond to. I'll give you the data. He was laughing. We had a good time. Um, so it turns out my article in their major paper was vindication for the government. It laid out the reasons why GMOs were dangerous in terms of health and et cetera. And when I, in, when I spoke at the House of Chiefs, they have like a Senate and a Congress and a House of Chiefs. I said, my name is Jeffrey Smith. I'm from the United States. So first of all, I apologize. And they all laughed. And then I told them what some of the things we're telling you now. So that was very, very interesting visit. I was treated like a hero, as was Mei Wan Ho. And we gave them some of the information that they could have used earlier. Um, and it was interesting when I went to South Africa, um, I ended up um, saying to them, it's stupid for you guys, they didn't use that word, it doesn't make economic sense for you to import genetically engineered feed to feed your animals for export to Europe, because many of the retailers have committed to using animals, animal products from animals that are only fed non GMO. So when I left, they, that was in their major, like their Wall Street Journal, their Financial Times. And then within three weeks, they suspended all imports of GMO animal feed pending a review on the economics. We also had an article about the dangers of bovine growth hormone, and it, it was put in every single, um, every single tabloid as well as the main paper saying cancer in every drop. And then the major retailer said, we don't use it, we don't use it. So that was also exciting. So it was fun visiting a country and in a few interviews or a few testimonies or whatever, you can change policy and, and ignite, ignite a fire that's just fantastic. Now, one thing that I, I did and when I, when I made this book, so I had been handing out this book, Seeds of Deception, to all these members of Congress some heads of state, etc. And they would have me sign it. Everyone would always have me sign it. It was very humbling for a president of a country to have me sign a book. But then, you know, if there was an aide around, he would give the book to an aide. Same with the minister, same with the senators. And it was like, it did work in Vermont, but not necessarily all around the world. And I realized it's a very hard book to just present. It doesn't present the science simply. The science is woven into these stories. It's a popular book, not a book for policymakers. So I said, I need to write a book that can be looked at quickly by the attention deficit politician, and yet it needs information for their staff to verify that this is true. So I came up with a two page spread format where like there's a top sentence that just gives the conclusion. So you can scan the book, rats fed BT corn had multiple health problems. Um, uh, mice fed GM potatoes had inter intestinal damage, et cetera, et cetera. And then I say, you can do a quick scan. You can do a casual read just by reading this side, which is the quotes, the quote from a scientist and the main points, or you can go to this side and get the details with the citations to the nearly 1200 endnotes. So I had written all of these things as 65 health risks. But I realized if I put that out there, some people would say, oh, no, 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 those things are handled. Uh, Mr. Smith doesn't really know what's being researched and looked at by the governments. So I did part two was how governments safety assessments are incompetent to identify nearly all the risks. And I when I went in a similar format where you could do a quick read, a casual read or a detailed study, I just blasted and pulled apart all of the assessments in the United States and Australia and other places in Europe, etc. And then one of my favorite sections, I love this section, industry studies not competent to identify most of the unpredicted side effects. Talk about rigged research. My God, we've caught them red handed doing things that were entirely unscientific. Remember Arpad Pustai said the most shocking moment in his career was not being fired from his job or discovering huge damage from GMOs to his his rats. It was reading the research that was used by, by was done by the industry 
and used as approval by government for their GMOs. So I, I, the, there's assumptions that are wrong, statistical methods that are wrong, controls that are wrong, everything, even when things go very wrong, they just assume it wasn't related to the feed. It's just ridiculous. So I'll give you one of my favorite assumptions. This is the assumption argument. <clears throat> Monsanto created high lysine corn for pig feed. Normally you add lysine into the feed. They put a gene into the corn to produce the lysine so you wouldn't have to add it. They said, <clears throat> this protein is, nor is naturally found in soil. We eat soil residues on food. <clears throat> so, shouldn't be any problem. It already has a history of safe use in the human food supply. So, Dr. Jack Heinemann <clears throat> from, uh, from New Zealand, this was being submitted to Australia and New Zealand, he decided to call their bluff. He figured out, what does the average American male eat in terms of quantities of corn per day? How much of that protein would be produced in that average meal if they ate only this high lysine corn? Because it could be eaten by humans as well. So let's say they ate their average amount per day and it was the high lysine corn. How much of that protein would they ingest? How much of that protein is found in soil? And how much soil would they have to ingest to get the same amount? To get the same exposure of that protein as is found in the corn on a daily basis, an average American male would have to consume 22,000 pounds of soil per second. <laughs> They were off by trillions in their calculation. 22,000 dumb trucks every second. So that's one example. We mentioned bovine growth hormone. Um, there were three scientists working at Monsanto who were testing the milk from cows treated with their bovine growth hormone. They found so much cancer causing um, IGF-1 the three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. This was told to me by a former Monsanto scientist. We know that there's massive amounts of increase of IGF-1. There's also an increase in bovine growth hormone. And the friends of Monsanto did a research saying, no problem. There's hardly any increase, but it's all destroyed during pasteurization. So the FDA, which waited to approve the RBGH, probably because they're waiting for the results of the study, said, no worries about bovine growth hormone because it's only 20, 37% increase in the milk and it's all destroyed during pasteurization. First of all, 37% increase in the milk is could be significant. There was no reason why that was considered insignificant. But the research didn't test Monsanto's injections into cows. They tested another version that had a 2% level, not on a daily basis. So the level of bovine growth hormone was probably vastly less, ignored by the FDA. But then the FDA said it's, it's 90% is destroyed during digestion. Well, it turns out that when the researchers Pasture that is destroyed during pasteurization. When the researchers pasteurized the milk, it evidently didn't work. So they pasteurized it at 120 times longer than normal. And they only destroyed 19% of the milk, not 90%. So they added powdered hormone to the milk, 47 times the amount of naturally occurring hormone of bovine growth hormone was added to the milk and then pasteurized 120 times longer than normal. And under those rigged conditions, 90% was destroyed during pasteurization. And that's what the FDA reported. Complete and utter nonsense. A new version of a Monsanto type study came to light during the, the Roundup trial on Roundup. They wanted to test the absorption of Roundup on human skin as is required. And they tested it on cadaver skin and about 10% absorbed, which was 
I understand 3.3 times the amount of allowable level. So they hid that information from the EPA illegally and they took new cadaver skin, baked it in an oven, froze it in a freezer, and then added Roundup to it, this leather-like human dead skin, hardly any absorbed, and that was the absorption level. They put, they told the EPA without letting them know that the skin had been baked and frozen. When uh, some friends did a study on phytoestrogen levels in GM soy compared to non-GM soy, they found that these supposedly healthy phytoestrogens were like 13 to 16, 12 to 16% less in GM. Monsanto quickly rushed to study, at the, rushed to, to print at the same time their own study that said there was so much ver in test, uh, statistical variability, you couldn't even do a statistical analysis to get a result. So now you had a he said, she said, and it, made, it means that there was no one in the world that was concerned about the phytoestrogens because there was two studies that said the opposite thing. Well, when I contacted the author of the study that said that there was a reduction, he told me, he looked at the research and found that it was the same laboratory that had done his research, that had done the research for Monsanto, because it was the number one expert in the world. So we called him and said, what gives? He said, they forced us to use an obsolete method of detection that we don't use anymore, which was prone to high variability. That was not published in the paper. You see, they will make changes in the research and then not make those changes public so they can force a conclusion. Or they simply ignore, like they hired Dr. Parry years ago because there was evidence in peer-reviewed research that Roundup or glyphosate caused genotoxicity, mutations that can lead to cancer. He was the world's expert at genotoxicity. They sent him four studies, look at it, and he said, yeah, it looks like it says, uh oh, send him all the studies. They sent him all the studies and said, yes, this actually strengthens the argument. You really need to do studies of the full formulation and not just glyphosate, but it appears that it is, can create these tumors. And you can read the, the documents from the Monsanto paper saying, has Dr. Perry ever done research for industry before? Meaning, doesn't he know he's being paid to come on our side? They said, we can invest a lot of money to try and turn him around, but let's just let him go. So they, he had written a report, which was legally had to be handed to the EPA. Monsanto buried the report, never showed it to the EPA. Instead, they ghost wrote a review paper with exactly the opposite conclusions and paid scientists to sign it. And that was the major review paper he used by the EPA to approve Roundup and glyphosate. It goes on. Before that, they had done some animal feeding studies at Industrial Biotech. Industrial Biotech did most of the, like 40% actually, of all the toxicological studies of the chemical companies and the pharmaceutical companies, and they got busted. It was a complete sham and fraud. They were not actually doing the studies. They would do two-year studies in eight months. They would, when animals died, they'd replace them. They had, there was terrible conditions. They would talk about the male rats had problems with their uterus. I mean, not logical. And when it was investigated, three people went to jail and it was described as one of the greatest scientific frauds in the history of the world, if not the greatest. Turns out when Monsanto submitted its research uh, request to IBT, one of their executives moved into IBT to do this, to oversee the study and then came back to Monsanto, he was one of the executives that went to jail. Uh, and when the EPA looked at all of these studies that had been done by IBT for the chemical companies for approving the chemicals, they decided not to require a redo. They just said, okay, we'll just, future studies have to be redone. When Dr. Seralini did his research on rats over two years and found that there was multiple massive tumors, early death and organ damage in rats that were fed Roundup Ready corn that had never been sprayed with Roundup, in rats that were fed Roundup Ready corn that had been sprayed with Roundup, and rats that were fed, fed Roundup without the corn. All three groups had multiple massive tumors, early death and organ damage, like 80 to 90 percent tumors versus maybe 30 percent in the controls. Well, the biotech industry attacked him, which is another thing that they like to do, saying he used the wrong rats. He used the same rats that Monsanto did on the study on that same genetically engineered Roundup Ready corn. They said he used the wrong size control groups. He used the same size control groups that Monsanto did. So their final argument was, 
He used Sprague Dolly rats. They typically have 80 to 90 percent um, of uh, tumor rate. And but Seralini's rats had only like 10 to 30 percent. I forget exactly what I think it's 30. It turns out he fed his rats organic control, organic feed, both the control and the experimental. So he had no chemicals in the, and he tested it, no chemicals in their feed, only the addition of the corn and the roundup. But he and his team tested later all of the rat chow and mouse chow around the world and found it was loaded with roundup and other chemicals and heavy metals. And so these Sprague Dolly rats in these other studies, the control groups were getting cancer at 80% or so because they were eating carcinogens in the control group, but his were not. So this is one way that they rigged their study. They feed the experimental group GMOs and Roundup, and they compare it to a control group eating GMOs and Roundup. I could go on quite a long time just talking about the rigged research. I find it very satisfying because it is so logical and diabolical. When they do a carefully controlled study and they have statistically significant results compared to their controls, they dismiss their own controls and they look for any control group anywhere in the scientific literature in history to see if it's possible that the experimental group compared to that control group didn't have statistical significance. And remember, if they find one, it could be that control group was fed GMOs and Roundup or poisoned, or maybe it was an IBT study. And so why would you have a control group in a study if you're going to disregard it? So this was an example of, it's called historical controls, completely unscientific. I showed a study to Arpad Pustai that had been hidden in the, in, in the FDA uh, papers that made, made public from a lawsuit sent to me by Steve Drucker, who pioneered the lawsuit. I sent it to Arpad Pustai. And he said, there were rats that were fed these tomatoes, flavor saver tomatoes, that died and were replaced in the study. He said, Jeffrey, you don't do that. And then they made this conclusion that these stomach lesions, they were like in seven of 20 um, rats that were fed this particular type of tomato, were not treatment, were not uh, treatment related. He said there was no biological reason to make that conclusion. And when they followed it with a follow-up study to try and prove that it didn't, they used a different formulation of the tomato, uh, either freeze-dried or not freeze-dried or concentrated, that didn't show the same thing and said, oh, see, this, this disproves the other one. He said, this is not how you do science. Anyway, I think I'll leave it there. These are some of my favorite studies. Now, when I was traveling around the world um, by 2006, um, I had been to maybe 25 countries and five continents. And people were coming up to me saying, you know, I noticed I can tell the difference when I ate a GMO. And I'm a little embarrassed to admit it that I didn't believe them because I figured it would just be some kind of epidemiological change in a graph. And maybe you've seen my graphs with more than 30 diseases rising in parallel with the increase of GMOs and Roundup. They hadn't been created yet. But in 2006, I was invited to the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. And I gave a talk and asked whether, whether the doctors would be prescribing non-GMO diets. I asked for a show of hands, and sure enough, many said they would. Now, each of these, I went in 2006, 7, 8, and 9. Same American Academy. And they had different themes. One year it was inflammation and allergies. One it was cancer. It was something else. So I would take all the research on GMOs about that particular theme and tell people, <clears throat> tell the doctors 
what the research was supporting the link between GMOs and that particular disease. So it was a fun exercise. Because having done all this research and just giving the same introductory lecture and over and over again, you have this 100% of my knowledge on GMOs and I get to speak on 1% every day, every night, over and over again. During interviews, it's even less. So it was fun gathering it all and making these PowerPoints. In 2009, I showed up to get an award, an environmental medicine award. <clears throat> I brought a video camera and I started interviewing uh, physicians. And they started telling me that their patients who were eating GMOs were getting inflammation more, were having higher allergic reactions. Dr. Emily Lindner told me that she puts everyone on a non-GMO diet and they all get better. And again, I was skeptical. So I said, what percentage? She said, I told you every, okay, 98%. I said, how many patients have you put on a non-GMO diet? She then took some time to calculate how many patients a day per week, how many years. She looked up and said about 5,000. I was like, whoa, can I go to your office and interview the patients? She said, sure. So I did, and I was hearing the same thing. Now, she was putting people on largely an organic diet and whole food diet, and sometimes gluten-free and sometimes dairy-free. And it was hard to identify whether it was the GMO or these other confounding factors. But around the same time, I went to some farms and interviewed the farmers who had taken pigs and cows off of GMO feed and put them on non-GMO feed. And they were experiencing the same improvements that I heard from the people in these, in her office and in other uh, practitioners' offices. The pigs were, get, were getting rid of diarrhea. The humans were getting rid of their Crohn's disease and irritable bowel symptoms and other things like that. And by the way, all the farmers that I interviewed who talked about their animals, what their difference was between GM and non-GM, they all use this very technical term, independent of each other, never hearing that someone else said it. They all said these animals are happier. One person said you could see it in their eyes. The other stories about the damage that come that, that happens to animals, the, the veterinarian that said the liver looks like it's been exploded and, and uh, others that talked about these things. But anyway, I realized that when these, when these farm animals are switched, they're not eating organic. And there's no gluten free pigs or dairy free cows. It was just the GMO. So it gave me confidence. So I started interviewing people in the audience, big survey audience, like, you know, tell me what percentage of your audience, of the audience, what percentage of you are eating up to 20% non-GMO, 20% or less, raise your hand, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100. And I got a chance to see the people in the audience, what their eating habits were by a show of hands. And at the end, after giving a talk for 15 minutes, half an hour, two hours, whatever, I'd say, now, how many plan, how 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 much non GM how much GMOs do you plan to eat? How many people you know plan to eat zero to twenty percent of your diet? Raise your hand. No one raised your hand ever. Hundreds of lectures, twenty except one time. Person raised their hand like this. I knew he was like a biotech plant. Um, twenty to 40, 20, zero to twenty, twenty to forty, forty to sixty, a bunch, sixty to eighty, more, eighty to hundred. Sometimes the whole room would raise their hand. So I was converting audiences to non-GMO eating and getting them to raise their hand, which helps them make the commitment. They saw other people doing it. It was verifying, it was helpful, and it told me that the lectures worked. But after, a, in 2012, when I released Genetic Roulette, the movie, not the book, and I was traveling around, Prop 37 was trying to label GMOs in California. I decided to do something. I said, okay, I'd go through that 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and I'd see how many people were largely eating GMOs, you know, between the 60 and 100. I said, to you, when you switch to non-GMO, how many people notice an improvement in your health? Virtually everyone raised their hand. I said, give me an example. Someone might say acid reflux, irritable bowel, diarrhea, and say, okay, how many people notice an improvement in digestion? That was always the number one. And then people say more energy, less brain fog, and then I would, that, was, that combination was always number two. It just, people were giving me incredible repetition from lecture after lecture. I did the same thing at about a dozen or two medical conferences where I said, about your patients that you put on a non-GMO organic diet, 
what kind of results are they getting? And they told me, and it was like verified. So we put out a survey of 3,256 people. And sure enough, the same results that we saw in the 150 lectures, 85% showed a uh, improvement, significant improvement in digestion, then uh, improved fatigue, improvements from fatigue, uh, weight gain or weight loss, you know, overcoming obesity, uh, brain fog, anxiety and depression, uh, allergic and, and food sensitivities, and that's all above 50%. And then there was about 24 others that went down to about 2%. But same kind of results, same relative order as the, as the um, lectures. And some were talking about in the survey, their kids or family members or their patients. So I decided to do uh, a film with Amy Hart called Secret Ingredients, where we actually interviewed some of the people to put faces to, these, to this data. And that turns out to be more effective than anything we've seen at convincing someone to eat an organic diet. Secret Ingredients at secretingredientsmovie.com. So in there, for example, so Amy Hart and I went to a, ch a chiropractic conference and I said from the talk, uh, if you have any stories you want to tell about your recovery or your pa or your patients, come to the to booth, give us your name, and we'll do an interview because we have a camera. <clears throat> so the first person to come in was Kathleen DiChiara, who is the main, her family, whoops, her family is the main family in here. Uh, 21 chronic conditions between the five of them, dramatic recovery, child is no longer on the autistic spectrum, etc. The next person to come in was Dr. Marcia Schaefer, also in there. She had a chiro has a chiropractic clinic, and for some reason, she ends up getting a lot of patients who have infertility because her infertility correction rate is astounding. And at the time, she had about 52 infertile couples that came to her, and all of them overcame their infertility and either were pregnant or had kids. By the time we did the movie, it was 92. Last time I talked to her was 123. And in every case, I said, how many couples who are following your protocol have not, or infertile, have not gotten pregnant? She said, zero. She has mindset, chiropractic, but she and I both agree, the number one, she puts them all on an organic diet. And I use the word organic, not just non-GMO, because if you've seen my lectures in the last five years, maybe 10, Roundup is a key player in some of these diseases, and Roundup is sprayed on non-GMO crops, but not on organic crops. So organic gets rid of the GMOs and the Roundup and a bunch of other nasties. Okay, so that's that. Now in my travels around, in my healing from GMOs and Roundup series, some people ask me what more can we do besides switch to non-GMO. So I interviewed a bunch of people, but I also interviewed Barbara Royal, who's a veterinarian. She wrote a book, The Royal Diet or something like that. Um, she's Oprah Winfrey's vet. I went there and interviewed her um, for a film that's available at petsandgmos.com. And she said that when she was in veterinary school, they never talked about allergies and cancer for dogs. Now it's constant almost every day. And they didn't have GMOs before, and now they did. So she was very cautiously suggesting that they change their diet and quickly found that 80 to 90% of the animals had either completely healed symptoms or were manageable by their next visit. So then it became her protocol, no matter what. Every single time she'd have a new client, a new patient, she'd put them on the new diet and they'd come back and very few needed attention, except of course the physical problems, you know, injuries. And it reminded me of Dr. Michael Fox, who wrote Animal Doctor, the um, column uh, read by 25 to 30 million. When GMOs were put on the market, he said he would get a raft of letters from people saying intractable diarrhea and itching and allergies. He said, take them off the GMOs. He filled up a file cabinet of letters confirming that that solved the problem. So there's a lot of stories about animals, pets and livestock with the GMOs. I think that I have some other possible stories here. Um, there's one about aspartame. 
just don't eat aspartame. Just take my word for it right now. There are stories about Percy. Um, there's different stories, but I think what I'll do since we only have 15 minutes left is, Ben, let's take questions. And um, I lovely, it would be lovely if you had questions about some of these stories um, or my experience over the 25 years of traveling around the world, but anything you want. Well, thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, really, it's just, just I, I, I'm speechless. You know, to hear these things, I mean, let's face it, it's an outrage is what it is, and that's putting it lightly. So um, I've got questions, but we'd love to have them from our audience. So I already see one hand raised. want to make sure everybody knows a couple of things. Tell everybody again, where's the best place to get your books and, and your movies and all of those things? Well, right now I've just, I'm transferring inventory. So at seedsofdeception.com, you'll get a sign saying, no orders right now, but you can bookmark it. You can probably get uh, Seeds of Deception and Genetic Roulette off of Amazon. ChelseaGreen.com has copies there. They they distribute to the book trade. Uh, Secret Ingredients movie. They're actually LiveHealthyBeWell.com has, you can access the film, the 90-day lifestyle upgrade, uh, healing from GMOs and and Roundup. Those are all online courses. And at responsibletechnology.org, you can get a list of products that have been tested for Roundup residues, find out which products are GMOs, sign up for the newsletter. You can sign up for two newsletters. Live Healthy, Be Well is one newsletter. We have a lot of products that help people get healthy. And responsibletechnology.org, lots of knowledge about things unfolding, our new plan to protect the global microbiome from genetically engineered microbes, our plan to try and restore regulation of gene editing through truth telling to power. So you could be part of that, not just here, but be very helpful to, to get this information and share it. And of course, I have been running entirely on donations. Um, in, in the first, I started the Institute in 2003 as a nonprofit and I was able to survive all the, all the um, donations I used to pay for an assistant half time. And I just survived on, on speaker fees and book sales. So at the end of the year, I had no money extra in the bank, but I lived great traveling, you know, eight, six to nine months a year for 13 years. Um, but now, now, you know, I needed to actually have some money. So we started to raise more money family foundations, grants, etc. And that has given us the opportunity to now have a staff. And now we need even bigger because we need to change laws around the world, not just conv convince consumers. And changing laws is expensive. But there's an existential threat. If you go to protectnaturenow.com, watch the movie, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, your jaw will drop in 16 minutes. You realize there's a new existential threat you never heard about. And we're mobilizing support to stop that. So please, when you go to responsibletechnology.org or protectnaturenow.com, please make a recurring donation so we know how much is coming each month so we can use it as part of our budgeting. Any amount, $5 a month, anything you can afford, and that would be very helpful. I uh, sure would. Thank you very much for that, Jeffrey. Uh, so yeah, folks, just a friendly reminder, you've got Jeffrey Smith. He's right here you get a chance to ask him a question with, with our few minutes left and please do go ahead and raise your hand. If you don't know how to do that, we ask you, and we normally don't take questions from the chat box. So we ask you to raise your hand first, go ahead and uh, click your reactions tab. That will show you the function to raise your hand. You click that. I'll see your raised hand and I'll call on you by name and unmute you. I see Kaylee is here. So let's jump right in with Kaylee and welcome Kaylee. Thank you. Jeffrey, thank you a thousand billion times for all you're doing. I love it. It's that one with the planet. It's one with my heart. And thank you. Um, please tell us, regarding Europe, regarding Italy especially, but the whole mainland Euro complex plus uh, the UK, where are they at in terms of what they are allowing their people to eat? What is allowed to be imported and what's not? Both plant food and beef meat for, for pets, uh, animals, and humans. Great question. <clears throat> in 1999 and 2000, because of the Arpad Pustai affair, all the majors committed to using non-GMO ingredients. It was this avalanche. The European Commission is pro-GMO. 
The European Parliament, which has representatives from every nation, generally votes against GMOs. But, the, but when they don't have a certain large enough vote, which they don't, the Commission comes in and dictates terms. So the Commission comes in and approves for food everything that's out there. All the stuff that's approved in the United States that may be imported into Europe, they'll generally approve. For planting, the, they've allowed different countries to have their own veto, and Spain and maybe Romania may be the only ones that plant GMOs. But the thing that's keeping it out of the main ingredients in GMOs is the commitment by, consume, by the food companies and a labeling regime that requires labeling if there's more than 0.9% uh, of any ingredient that's genetically engineered. But they don't have labeling for animal products where the animals are fed GMOs. So most of the animal feed in Europe is from genetically engineered soy and corn. <clears throat> now, there are certain retailers that have a lot of power there that say their chickens or their cows or whatever are only going to be fed non-GMO. But you have to find them, find which, which ones have committed to non-GMO. So if you eat meat in Europe or, or dairy or eggs, and you don't know, it's oftentimes part of the uh, feed is GMO. Um, and there's very little grown in, in Europe, but they, they import a lot from Brazil. In addition, they are requiring the gene edited GMOs, which are a disaster, to be labeled as well and to go through the same regulatory review as GMOs. That's not the case in the US. We've abdicated and deregulated gene editing. Same for par partially deregulated in the UK, just deregulated in India, deregulated in Australia, I think Brazil and, and Argentina as well. So that's a huge, huge problem, meaning that so cheap and easy to gene edit right now, it could convert our food supply. And we won't know because no authority is, is announcing or requiring labels or even, you can just do it secretly. So we're trying to reverse that. Um, so in, in Germany, there is a non-GMO label and that's very strict. So if something has the non-GMO label, it's like the non-GMO project here, you know that it's met higher criteria than simply avoiding contains GMO requirement. You'll see very pro few products in Europe say contains GMO. There's not a huge enforcement there, so there may be some contamination, but uh, it won't be as significant, and certainly organic will be way safe. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, up next, and I, I'm not sure if I'm, I hope I get your name right. Is it uh, Twila, Twila? Twila. You did well. Sure. <laughs> um, can you talk for a moment about how our USDA is infiltrated by Monsanto people? And I'm thinking of Tom Vilsack at the moment. Tom Vilsack was the governor of Iowa. I used to live in Iowa. And he was the biotech governor of the year. And um, I remember asking him a tough question at the World Food Prize conference. And then than sharing his answer and critiquing it around the world. He knows who I am. <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't let a USDA person speak at a, at a conference that I met, and one person was able to speak at a different day because they don't want to be embarrassed when I point out what's going on at the USDA. Um, when Jerry Roseman, my first film was called Hidden Dangers in Kids' Meals. And I, I talked about Jerry Roseman, who was, his cows wouldn't get pregnant. And then there were also pigs who weren't getting pregnant with, this, with eating the GMO corn. And they tested very high in a mycotoxin and all. There was someone from the USDA that was planning to do a study to debunk him. And it was gonna be one of those fake studies and someone who was a kind of a insider told Jerry about it, so it got out and so they never did it. So there's a strong, there are elements in the USDA that are basically aligned with Monsanto. Um, 
there's an interesting thing that during the night in 2016 when the labeling law of the Vermont legislature was starting to be to go public the biotech industry got the Congress to pass what was called the Dark Act to denying Americans the right to know and um, then they switched the labeling from the FDA, the FDA to the USDA because even though the FDA has a mandate to promote GMOs, did not require labeling, did not require testing, the biotech industry believed that the USDA was, clo was a closer friend. Sonny Perdue, who was the previous Secretary of Agriculture, he was also Biotech Governor of the Year. So it went from Vilsack to Perdue to Vilsack. And the labeling that came out, the labeling law that was came out from the USDA was probably written by Monsanto. It loopholes virtually almost everything that's genetically engineered, provides easy ways to hide the fact that it's GMO on the label. <clears throat> it's a disaster. <clears throat> so the USDA has not been our friend as far as GMOs go. And Vilsack's concept is, his answer, is his patent answer was, if I'm a father, I want to support all of my kids, the GMO, the organic, the non-GMO, let them all you know, have their way, completely not in, not addressing the fact that the GMOs are a bully because they're going to contaminate the others and uh, destroy the ability for the others to continue to have pure product. But they all have votes. Um, thank you, Jeffrey, for that. And um, let's go now to uh, Laura. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Let's see if that works. Hi, Laura. Hey, how's everybody? Oh my God, I'm like so overwhelmed. So, so a couple quick things. Um, what would be if if those of us that even eat organic wanted to get some sort of a test to see if we have glyphosate or any kind of genetically engineered molecules in our blood? Is there like a test that we could get? And number two, if there is glyphosate or any type of genetically engineered molecule in our blood. And we have all these studies that you cited about animals with horrible disfigurements and cancers. Like, can we, I mean, I see, I see law firms all the time asking people, did this happen to you? Did that happen to you? We're filing a class action suit. So one, can we, <clears throat> can we figure, is there a way to determine what's going on in our own blood? And two, is there a way for us to join together to form some kind of an action against the producers of glyphosate and GMOs because it's in our blood, in our bodies, and it's pro a problem. I'm making notes because there's a lot to talk about here. This will be the last question. <clears throat> okay. There is a study, I mean, a test you can do to find out if there's glyphosate in your urine or in your hair. Health Research Institute does that there in Fairfield, Iowa. We have a link on our site at responsibletechnology.org to give you a little discount. Um, HRI, Health Research Institute. They, I think, last time I checked, they had the, the best science uh, on the testing, which is why we recommend them. Um, you can, if you, like I talked about healing from GMOs and Roundup, that you can take a look at livehealthybewell.com and watch a series of interviews I've done. Dietrich Klinghart talked about um, a glyphosate detox. And he said the sickest patients, oftentimes the autistic boys, would have no glyphosate in their urine until he started the detox, and then it would start to trickle out. So it's possible that glyphosate largely goes out through the urine, but some of it gets deposited in the organs and then makes its way to the bone marrow. Um, and can be there on a permanent basis, wreaking havoc. And that's probably why it's linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because of the bone marrow. Um, so it turns out it wasn't leaving the body through the urine of some of these very sick patients until they started the detox protocol. And I've heard that again since from one other doctor who said that he need, they needed to do a detox in order to get it out of the body. But most people have it found in their urine. In fact, um, people who get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is linked to glyphosate and Roundup, they have a lot of 
glyphosate in their urine. The people that have the more serious disease have more glyphosate in their urine. So it's typically that way. Um, it's interesting that part of the gene from Roundup Ready soybeans transfers into the DNA of our gut bacteria. So this is a patented gene. So we could theoretically say, Monsanto, you said to farmers when the, your patented plants get on their property, you'll go and remove it. What about the genes inside my body that are now integrated into our gut bacteria? There was one study that showed this from 2004, and they found, <clears throat> as soon as they found out that this happened, the pro-GMO UK government canceled funding for a few of the future research. So we don't know much more about it. We don't know, for example, if the BT toxin gene that's produced, that's found in corn, transfers to gut bacteria and continues to function. If it does, it might cause our gut flora to produce living, to produce pesticides. It'd be living pesticide factories. And this pesticide is known to enhance or to elevate an immune response, an allergic response, both to itself, inflammation, etc., and create sensitivity to other formless compounds and foods. It also can drill hole, holes in human cells in high concentration, as shown in laboratories. That's how it kills insects. So in a study of blood taken from Canadian women who were pregnant, 93% of them had BT toxin in their blood and 80% in the, in the unborn fetus. Now, why would so many have it in their blood? Because it probably washes out regularly. The corn that they eat every day is mostly without the BT toxin because it's like high fructose corn syrup, no longer the toxin, toxin's no longer there. The, the people who wrote the study said, well, maybe it's eating the animal products because the animals are fed a lot of BT toxin in their cotton meal and in their corn. So maybe that caused the BT toxin to be there on a regular basis because you need a regular amount of BT toxin in your diet to end up with 93% the, of the people in the blood. But the other opportunity is maybe their own gut bacteria was producing the BT toxin from the times that they did eat corn chips, corn meal, polenta, where the whole corn, the, the DNA was available and the gene transferred. So that means that it's possible that we may be carrying around Monsanto's genes wreaking havoc. I use the word Monsanto, they've been purchased by Bayer, so Monsanto Bayer. So that's a serious issue. There's no protocols that I know of to test for it or to clear it, but the body's very resilient. Even in rats that were fed GM soy for eight months and had damage in their livers and testicles and kidneys, or when they switched to non-GM soy for a month, it started to reverse. So eat organic. If you need extra help, watch the movie, watch the series, Healing from GMOs and Roundup at livehealthybewell.com. And the last thing I'll say is this, because that's a pretty heavy note to leave on. If you end up eating GMOs accidentally or because you don't control your diet, or you think there may be some issues inside you, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because worrying is toxic. GMOs and Roundup are toxic. Now you're adding another toxicity. Your upbeat, enthusiastic, loving heart surcharges your physiology, your immune system, your happy chemicals, etc. It's an important part of the regimen of healing from GMOs and Roundup and of living in a toxic world because you're not going to be able to avoid Roundup in every case. It's in the rain. It's in the war. It's in the air, depending on where you are in the United States. It's in sometimes in the drinking water. It's sometimes in low, low, low amounts, even in organic food. So do your best. Don't worry about it. Stay upbeat. And if you have a little energy to engage in activism, go to responsibletechnology.org, 
and join the team. We'd love to have you on board. Thank you everyone for this opportunity to walk down the corridors of my 25 years, it's now 26 as an activist and share some of my favorite stories. There's more, but we run out of time. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much for all of your time. I, I feel like we should have set up a fireplace so that we could all sit around it while you were telling these stories. And, um, you know, uh, on behalf of our audience, you know, what an opportunity to have this intimate moment with you to just hear somebody who's been through all of this, just tell the stories. And uh, so I know I speak for so many people uh, with regards to that. By the way, folks, want to make sure everybody understands if you're on the edge of your seat like I am hearing these stories, just keep in mind, Jeffrey's going to be back tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern with a panel of folks. It is not to be missed. So, it, you know, just stay with us for the, for the rest of this, this time here together. Jeffrey, thank you so much. I know I'm not the only one that wants to thank you. So we're going to unmute our entire audience who I know wants to thank you as well. What do you want to say, everybody? I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you.